So a night that belongs to Donald Trump and his supporters. Mr. Trump had played on fears of immigrants and worries about the economy to defeat Vice President Harris. Analysts say his victory signals the advent of international isolationism, sweeping tariffs, and perhaps more worrying for his political enemies, score settling. So what is Mr. Trump likely to do on the world stage? Well, let's get an assessment from Europe now. And for this, I'm joined on the line from London by the European Affairs Analyst, Dr. Marek Laskovic. Uh, thank you very much indeed for joining us, uh, Dr. Laskovic. So what a night. And Donald Trump now officially, categorically, and absolutely the next president of the United States. Quite an astonishing performance. Would you have predicted this outcome just a few days ago? To be honest, it was on the cards, but only 50-50. I certainly would not have expected him to win as much as he did because it's quite a crushing victory, one which is worrying many Democrats there because, of course, many senators and people who are in politics are wondering just what the knock-on effect will be for them. So I would not, I would not have said emphatically that Donald Trump must win, but I would have said it was a possibility. Indeed. So it went so right for Mr. Trump and so wrong for Miss Harris. How is Europe reacting to this Trump victory? With trepidation. There are at least four problems. The first one is trade. Donald Trump has made trade his number one electoral winning strategy, and it won. There's no other way of putting it. And therefore, it is to be expected that there will be tariffs, that there will be terms of trade will be dramatically altered and that this of course affects Europe quite dramatically because uh, America is an important trading partner. It has effects for other countries in the world as well of course, China being an obvious one, but that is a key one. Number two, the war in Ukraine. Um, it was actually initially the continental Europe, Poland apart, uh, namely France and Germany who were lukewarm about this war, but since then that's changed and they're more enthusiastic about conducting it, whereas Trump is not. And therefore, it follows quite clearly that there might be a real problem in Ukraine carrying on this war, and this has implications for uh, the EU. According to my books, I've stated before that Ukraine was always simply the first on Russia's uh, menu, so to speak, and therefore we must expect that if Donald Trump will end this war, by means of territory secession, just outright, that the war will continue, hence Europe's trepidation. Number three, there is the problem of NATO, which is a very big problem. Trump simply don't, thinks that Europe is not pulling its weight. Actually, it is better than it was before, and it has to be said in part owing to his previous presidency. Previously, only three countries out of the 32 could pay the 2% of GDP. Now it's 23 who can pay it. So there is some sort of uh, distinct improvement there. And though still many countries remain to pay the full whack, uh, it is clear that unless they do, Donald Trump will take measures. And number four is sheer incalculability. It's quite impossible to guess what he's going to do next. The Americans like that sort of thing. And it's not clear what he's going to do. Never mind Ukraine, who has a number one issue, but China is another one because, of course, there's a problem there, especially about Taiwan. And there's, of course, the Middle Eastern war. So it's quite impossible to work out what he's going to do. And therefore, that is why the Europeans are worried. And uh, I suppose for a lot of the um, right-thinking Europeans, and, of course, a, a graduate of Haberdasher ASCII's <laughs> such as you are, <laughs> yes. I mean, with, with, a very, yes. with a very linear way of thinking, I, I imagine that would be quite a problem. Um, but you talked oh, about absolutely. Ukraine. Sorry, go on. No, absolutely. If you think the exact opposite are the Germans, yes, who are renowned for being calculated each move in advance. <laughs> with Donald Trump, we, have, we literally can't tell what he's going to do tomorrow. Well, uh, absolutely. And of course, you, you mentioned... Um, Dr. Laskovich there about U Ukraine. It'll be three years in February since the war there began. Um, as you said, the impact of a Trump victory will be most keenly felt there. I suppose the question is not so much what will happen to Ukraine under Mr. Trump, but what Ukraine 
and everyone else can do to adapt to this new reality? The reality is quite simple. Donald Trump is the most powerful leader in the world. And what he decides to do, there's no one else who can restrain him or constrain him. And therefore, it's a question of adapting to what he wants or does not want, or else trying to go it alone. And it's quite clear that Ukraine without America can't really go it alone. It's not only the question of the money. I mean, we're talking about America has poured billions in. And in fact, it was one of Donald Trump's key punchlines that uh, President Zelensky is the world's greatest salesman because every time he visits America, he comes with $50 billion. It's the quality of the arms that America is supplying. There really is no one in that league. And therefore, Ukraine will be a very great difference in carrying on. And what's more, Donald Trump knows this. Hence his point, he can finish the war in 24 hours. Well, perhaps not 24 hours, but he can certainly put a huge, his huge leverage on Ukraine. Absolutely. And, and uh, just picking up on that thing you said there about Mr. Trump saying that he would end the war in a day, um, we're obviously, I mean, you know, going to see how he's going to go about doing that. But if there is a peace deal, is it likely to be one that is more sympathetic towards Russia than Ukraine, just judging from Mr. Trump's rhetoric? Yes. The point is that as I see it from everything he has stated, he is in favor of direct territorial concessions, period. This means that it's not, as I would have advocated and do so in my books, a compromise. It is actually just an outright secession to stop the war. And this, of course, is actually quite important for America because America has a huge debt problem. It, it is enormous. It's actually virtually unpayable. And therefore, they simply cannot afford to carry on paying out huge sums of money to Ukraine. And for this reason, if he does this, there's unlikely to be anyone in America who's going to stop him. And this means, in turn, that Ukraine will be faced with a point-blank decision, sign or else. And the problem is, if they do sign, sure, the war will stop there, but Russia can carry on in other places. This has always been the danger. This is what I foresaw in my books. And this is what is now likely to happen. Well, absolutely. I do recall skimming the pages of uh, some of your books there. Meanwhile, of course, uh, the Kremlin in Russia has indicated that there are no plans to congratulate Mr. Trump, referring to the U.S. as an unfriendly country. What do you read into that? One of the problems in dealing with the Russians is they can play double games, in this sense, like a Russian doll. Uh, what you see on the outside is not what's happening inside, hence Churchill's famous comment about an enigma being wrapped in a puzzle. It's by no means clear that Russia uh, does not like Trump being in power. It's just that they're hiding this. And therefore, I read the statement as simply a neutral statement. And therefore, what they're perhaps already thinking of in terms of negotiating is uh, already making a stance about how much territory they would want from Ukraine. I read it, therefore, as not a direct threat to USA, but simply indicating a hard negotiating stance in order to end this war. Very good talking with you, as always, uh, Dr. Marek Laskovic. He is the European Affairs Analyst. He was talking to me on the line there from London.